We're going to be walking through the book of Nehemiah, uh, virtually, verse by verse. Uh, I can't promise we're going to touch on every single verse, but we're going to do our best. We're going to walk through the book of Nehemiah to give you a handle on what God is teaching us through this book of the Bible. And so uh, I invited you to bring your Bibles because like in my, my copy of the scriptures, I underline phrases. I try to remember things. These uh, notes that I might make in the margin live there for every time in the future that I might open the scriptures to that page. And it helps remind me what God was doing in this season and help me stay connected to those truths. So I hope that you'll do that and follow along. We also have your listening guide. You can make some notes on the, on the, on the blank spot. There's some notes for you to take uh, as we jump into this. And, uh, and I hope that you will follow along and make some notes. But I want to start with this question. How many of you have a dream? You have a dream. You feel like God has given you some kind of dream in life. And I mean something bigger than like your dream home or your dream car or your dream vacation. I'm talking about some kind of dream where you feel like God has given you a specific calling or burden or ministry or mission. Do you have that? Because I believe that God made you for that. I believe God has hardwired into every human being this deep need for purpose. This deep need to make our lives count for something bigger than ourselves. And I believe that God wants us not only to discover what that dream is, but to live our lives fulfilling that dream. And I'll just give you some, just a word of warning on this. You were made with this desire to have a dream, this, this space for a dream in your heart and in your soul. And if you do not get that dream from God, you will spend your life trying to fill up that gap with lesser dreams. You'll default to a dream home, to a dream car, to a dream vacation, to the dream spouse, to the dream kids, to the dream job. You'll default to some lesser dreams. And then you're gonna wake up one day and you're gonna wonder why your life, as good as it seems to be on the surface, why it's not fulfilling in your soul. Because God made you for more than that. He made you to leverage your life for something beyond you. In fact, I believe, he, it, I believe it only counts the way God intends it when we see our lives as part of God's great story that he's writing, that we're a part of God's big story, not our little story, which means, and I, th this is where the, the difficulty is, it means to a degree we have to give up a little bit of our story in order to get on board with God's story. We've got to prioritize things differently. We have to say, you know what? It's more important for me to give my life to the things of God than to give my life to the things of me. That's a big step. It's actually where Nehemiah picks up. If you were to open the Bible right to Nehemiah chapter one, you're going to discover in chapter one that Nehemiah gets caught up in what I'm going to call today a holy discontent. To, all, to some degree, we're all discontent with something, right? Right? And most of the things that we're discontent with are things that are unholy or not necessarily holy, right? These things that we wish there was, you know, better air conditioning or we wish that, you know, our car was nicer. We're kind of discontent with different things like that. But Nehemiah discovers a holy discontent, something that's about God that he's discontent with. He's discontent with God's kingdom in some way. He wants to see God's will done. And he's discontent until that happens. See, uh, God's given me a holy discontent. It's not something I necessarily set out to find, but I believe God gave that to me. And I believe that when you guys hear me talk about marriage and family, that's the holy discontent I have. You know, it really bothers me when marriages aren't working like they should. It's more than when my marriage isn't working like it should. It bothers me when your marriage isn't working like it should. Everybody's bothered when their own marriage isn't working. It bothers me when your marriage isn't working. It's hard for me to sleep when close friends go through a divorce. It bothers me. It frustrates me. God has given me a holy discontent about marriage, particularly, and also about parenting and family life. That's why I talk about it every time I get a chance. Because I want to see your marriages thrive. I want to see your marriages do well. And what's funny is, I want to see everybody's marriages do well. But you know what? Sometimes it's as, it's as narrowed down to that couple it's as focused as a husband and a wife. And man, if, if just their marriage could get better, then I feel like I would be making progress. 
Do you have a burden of holy discontent from God? If you don't, I'll tell you probably why you don't. Because you don't see your life in light of God's story. You don't see your life fitting into God's great plan. And long before we get to Nehemiah, we begin to see God's plan. And you can't really understand the book of Nehemiah, what Nehemiah did, why Nehemiah had a vision, and why he went to work. You're not going to get it until you understand that Nehemiah saw his life in light of God's great story. There's more going on than just Nehemiah's little part. And so what we're going to do right now is I'm going to give you about 1,600 years of Jewish history in about five minutes. So I want you to write these things down. I'm going to put it and give you a one word sort of uh, chunks that you can grab hold of this because Nehemiah didn't just show up. Nehemiah was part of a big story of God that started way back when God made a covenant with Abraham. We call this period the period of the patriarchs. The patriarch started with Abraham. God made a covenant with a man named Abraham, and he says, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to bless all the people that come from you. I'm going to multiply you into a great nation. You will outnumber the grains of sand on the seashore, and you will outnumber the stars in the sky, and your, your nation, your, the seed of your life, will be here to bless everyone in the world. You will serve a great purpose. He tells that to Abraham, and Abraham has a son named Isaac. Isaac carries that on to his son, Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons. Talk about a crazy person. 12 sons. Okay, I got five and I'm crazy. All right. He has 12 sons and his 11th son is named Joseph. Joseph is a key player. And when you think about the patriarchs, Joseph was the object of his father's affection. His brothers were jealous. They sold him into slavery. He ends up in Egypt. He rises up through the ranks of Egypt and becomes number two in all of Egypt. He uses his position of power and authority during a difficult time of, of famine, and he brings his family into Egypt to live and thrive in Egypt. And as, as long as he lived, the fame and the favor of Joseph protected the Hebrew nation as they grew and thrived in Egypt. Well, then Joseph dies, and a Pharaoh comes to town, a new Pharaoh who does not remember the favor of Joseph. And so he gets jealous as the Pharaoh, and he says, the Israelites are beginning to outnumber us. We need to, we need to enslave them. And so the Pharaoh enslaves all the Egyptians and puts them to work. In this time of slavery, the people of God cry out to their God and say, please save us, come to our, our aid, please help us. And God raises up a servant. His name was Moses. And this is where we enter into the second period in, of, of Jewish history. Now we're into the period of the Exodus. And God has raised up Moses. Moses, you remember, you, we all remember Moses, right? Let my people go, plagues, Red Sea, long walk. We got Moses. So... Moses goes in and frees the people, right? He walks them out into the desert. They're, they're free from their slavery. But they complain. And they whine. And they think, oh, why did we come out to the desert to die? We should have stayed in, Israel, in, in Egypt. And Moses has to coach them and lead them. And God's working with them. And because of their sin, God says, you know what? You're going to have to just make laps around the desert for 40 years until all this unbelieving generation dies off. We're going we're to just let them all, all the unbeliever, believing people are going to die off. And we're going to raise up a new generation. Because God made a promise that he would have a people and they would have a land of their own. And so then... Moses and that previous generation dies and the, port, the torch is passed on to Joshua and now we enter into the promised land. So we go from the patriarchs to the exodus to the promised land. Now Joshua goes in and fights a bunch of wars and he claims the, the, the promised land for the people of God and now they've established themselves in God's land and they finally get to be free to worship God in their own land. And there they are in the promised land living to the glory of God. And so as they struggle, like most of us do, following God in our freedom, God sent judges to help keep them on track. And he also sent kings to keep them on track. And finally, a great king rose up. His name was King David. He was the greatest king in all of Israel's history. 
David was the leader of a time of great prosperity for the Israelite nation. He began to build cities and create a prosperous nation. During his reign, he has a son named Solomon. Solomon is given the great task to build the beautiful, glorious temple of God. Bible historians know, refer to it as the first temple, because later we're going to find that it's destroyed. But Solomon builds this great temple to the Lord, and the people are thriving. These are the days when David's writing the Psalms, and Solomon's writing the Proverbs, and we're learning about the wisdom of God, and the joy, and the celebration. All this stuff is taking place, but man, just like we do, the Israelites did not handle prosperity well. And so as they begin to waver from the Lord and not stay true to their commitment to God, not stay true to the law, God enters them into a season known as the prophets. And so God sends prophets. These are men and women of God who come to speak the truth of God to the people of God so that they might repent and turn back and follow God and trust him. And they come one after the next after the next in the midst of all this upheaval in the uh, nation of Israel. Israel splits into two camps, the northern kingdom known as Israel, much smaller kingdom, and the larger kingdom known as, in the, in the south, known as the, the kingdom of Judah. They're broken up into these two nations. And during that time, the prophets are speaking into, into these two nations saying, turn back to God, trust in him, repent of your sin, and they don't do it. And as God promised through the prophets that one day, your enemies will come in and they will take you over and you will no longer be free. And so we enter into the period of time known as captivity and exile. The northern kingdom was virtually destroyed by the Assyrians. And then about 130 years later, the Babylonians come in and they take captive the southern kingdom of Judah. And they're exiled to go live in Babylon a pagan nation, a nation that doesn't believe in God, a nation that has very little tolerance for worshiping freely as you will. And there they are, God's great nation, captive and exiled in Babylon. And that is when we meet Nehemiah. See, Nehemiah, he grew up in Babylon. He grew up as a captive Israelite exiled to Babylon. And as he was growing up, a little bit before we get to Nehemiah chapter 1, God was on the move to restore his, his name and restore his people. And this period of time begins called return and restoration, where God raises up Ezra. See, the book Ezra and Nehemiah used to be considered one document, one book. And Ezra is raised up and he goes back to Jerusalem and he rebuilds the temple. He had plans to rebuild the whole city and, and, and rebuild the walls, but through a number of political problems, he couldn't move forward, but the temple was built. It's known as the second temple. And the people of God had a temple, but the city was not ready. The city was not complete. We weren't quite there yet. And that's when God brings Nehemiah into the picture. So Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of this guy that I can't pronounce. <laughs> now it happened in the month of Chislev, which is November, December, November, December. In the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the capital, and Hannah and I, one of my brothers, uh, came with certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped and had survived the exile and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the exile are, is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. So Nehemiah, if you get the picture, Nehemiah is just living life, doing his deal in Babylon. He actually has a really sweet job. He's the cupbearer to the king. So every day he eats and drinks whatever the king is going to eat or drink to make sure it's good for the king, make sure he doesn't die. And so that's his job. He's just clocking into work every day. And his brother comes back from a trip to Israel, a trip to Jerusalem the holy city of God. And he's very interested. He says, hey, bro, what's going on in Jerusalem? 
How are our people doing? What, what's going on back home? And his brother says, bad news. The people are in great trouble. The walls are broken down. It's a shameful situation. See, if we didn't know the history of the Hebrew nation, the Israelites, the Jews, if we didn't know their history, we would say, what's the big deal? A city in the ancient world that's been ravaged and, and broken down. That was a pretty common thing. It's a big deal because God made a promise to a man named Abraham. And every time God's promise looked at risk or a threat, it was a really big deal, just like it is today. And so Nehemiah hears this, and he realized this is not a good situation. And he is moved. Look what the scripture says. In verse 4, it says, as soon as I heard these words, this is Nehemiah speaking, I sat down and I wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Let me just ask a question. Let me just normalize this. How many of you have ever done that? Any news at all? Any bad news at all? How many of you have responded with weeping and prayer and fasting and mourning? How many of you have been in a situation like that? It is very few. We look at this and we think, Nehemiah, you're really reacting strongly here. Right? Good things are happening in Jerusalem. There's a temple there. See, Nehemiah knew better. Nehemiah was serious about this because he was serious about the promise of God made to Abraham. He had not forgotten the story. He understood that at any place in the story, we have to look at it through the lens of the whole story. And so Nehemiah was crushed at this news because the people of God were still scattered and the reputation of God was still tainted and he would not have it. He got a holy discontent with this situation. He was unwilling for life to go on as normal. Now this is interesting. I was starting to think how to, how to really capture this. I had a friend, uh, he's a Jewish friend, and he and some friends went to uh, Washington, D.C. for a visit, and they decided to go and visit the National Holocaust Museum. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's a stunning museum. It's, it's so well done. And... Um, they go in for the visit, they take the tour, they come out, and the Jewish friend was telling me that his non-Jewish friend comes out and he asks him, what did you think about the museum? And his non-Jewish friend responded this way. He said, it was awesome. The Jewish friend, as many of you can put together, the Jewish friend of mine said he was offended, and rightfully so. Because what you just witnessed walking through the National Holocaust Museum is not something you describe with the word awesome. It's like you just didn't see it. The only way you get that wrong is to not really pay attention. Because it is, it is the antithesis of awesome. It is sobering. It is serious. It is heart-wrenching. It is awful. It is, it is disturbing. It is angering. But it is not awesome. Now, we understand why someone might say that, but we also understand that we ought to pay attention more, right? This is what happens to you and me. When we hear about the will of God going undone and we sort of shrug our shoulders and go, hmm, I guess it's okay. We don't have a holy discontent. Therefore, we misrespond to things that we should be responding seriously to. The will of God is not happening all over our world. And we go on watching TV, and we go on playing like everything's okay. And God wants to stir up in us a holy discontent anytime we see these areas where God's will is not happening, where God's reputation is tainted. It's why I care about your marriage. Here's the thing, guys. God showed me <clears throat> in John 13. I was reading God's word, and in John 13, it says, Jesus is quoted, and it says, this is how they will know you're my disciples. And you guys know what's coming. Some of you know what's coming. He says, this is how you'll know. This is how the, this is how the world will know that you're my disciples. By how you love one another. 
That's what he says. So the way we love each other is how the whole world's going to know who Jesus is. Now, do you know what hit me between the eyes? If I can't love the one person I am most committed to, my husband or wife, how in the world am I going to love everybody else? And in that moment, when I read that text, holy discontent filled me up. Not because you need happy little marriages, but because when you love each other well in your marriage, you give the world something to look at. You give the world a picture of the gospel. They know that you know him because of the way you love each other. So I'm discontent about this deal. Nehemiah was discontent with the, with the situation in Jerusalem. I'm praying that today God would begin to lay something on your heart, that he would begin to reveal something to you that you should be discontent about. Whether it be in the life of an individual person, one person that you want to invest in, or a whole nation of people somewhere in the world, that God would give you a burden. That God would give you a reason to sacrifice, a reason to serve, a reason to give your best. And so, Nehemiah is rattled, he's frustrated, he's serious, he's responding, and his prayer goes like this. This is his prayer to God. O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants. Confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, then you're outcast. In the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make a name, to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. So Nehemiah prays. Now let me just give you my issue because I see that and it's awesome. The first thing Nehemiah does is pray. And I often don't do that. My first reaction to, to a holy discontent is not usually to pray. I'll tell you what mine is. I, I, tend, to, I tend to give, here's my excuse. I'm action oriented. And so prayer kind of feels like not really action. It feels more like passivity. And I don't want to be passive. So I'm going to be active. I want to get up and get moving right? But let me just tell you the arrogance in that approach. The arrogance is my moving is somehow more important than God moving. Because prayer is when I go to God and ask God to move. With the humility and the understanding that God, if I just jump out and start going, I'm going to mess this thing up. God, we need you to move. So with your holy discontent, with this purpose that God's given you, with this calling that he's placed on your life, what do you do? You pray. We pray first. We don't start acting and doing and moving around. We, we pray. We say, God, we want you to do what only you can do. We want you to pray. What I love about Nehemiah's prayer, it is so rooted in the word of God. If you read what he, what he prays, he's literally quoting some of the law in the Old Testament. He's not trying to make things up. He's not trying to spin God into something that was his idea. He's getting his calling, he's understanding this burden through the word of God. Now let me give you a, a reason for this, what's well, so important, an action for you. If you wanna take action, here's the action. You cannot develop an understanding of God's ways or a passion for his will apart from a commitment to God's word. You've got to go to God and read his word and find where your holy discontent and God's word meet. Otherwise, you're winging it. And that's not the way we do things 
Here's the bottom line. God's ways and God's will are revealed in God's word. And we've got to become students of God's word so that we understand his ways and his will. So that we know where to operate. We know where to move. It drives me crazy. And you should be just as skeptical as me when someone comes up to you and goes, oh, God's calling me to do something. I've got an idea. And I believe God told me that I should do this because I was driving down the street and there was a bird that flew across. His wings were out. It reminded me of Jesus on the cross. Right? No. No, 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 no. No, please don't do that. That is superstitious. Please don't do that. Right? I, I don't know what to do about this relationship I'm, I was in and I was driving down the highway and I saw exit. And I, oh, I got a breakup. Right? No. Come on now. I was having parenting problems. I wasn't sure what to do with my kids. I'm struggling with discipline. And Michael Jackson's song, Beat It, came on. And I thought, great idea. No, that is not how we do things. Right? That's not how you get a word from God. That is making stuff up. That is, that is being emotionally tossed around. We need to go to the, to the stability of God's word and say, God, hey, I'm passionate about something. My passion could be off. My emotions could be overactive. God, show me in your word so that I know for sure that's what you want. And Nehemiah prays that way. His whole prayer is not just Nehemiah's great idea to go do something. It's based on God's word. In fact, I want to show you where it comes from. Deuteronomy 4. This is like a, I don't even know, this is over a thousand, about a thousand years before Nehemiah even prays this. He's referring back to Moses. Back to the law, back to what is solid, what is firm, what you can count on. Deuteronomy 4, verse 25. Look at what this says. It's amazing. When your father's children and your children's children have grown old in the land, if you act corruptly by making a carved image in the form of anything and doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord your God and so provoke him to anger, I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you today that you will soon utterly perish from the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. You will not live in it long, but it will be utterly destroyed. And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples. Now, what that, that's what happened. The Babylonians came in and scattered all the people. They were exiled for that reason. And you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. And there you will serve gods of wood, stone, the work of human hands that neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. But from there... You will seek the Lord your God and you will find him. Isn't that what Nehemiah discovered? You will seek him and you will find him. If you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. And when you're in tribulation, Jerusalem is in trouble. And these things come on to you in the latter days. You will return to God and you will obey his voice. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. And he will not leave you or destroy you. Or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. He never forgot the promise. Nehemiah, his prayer was not his own good idea. His prayer was the actual words of God. He was quoting them from memory, which tells us something about Nehemiah. He lived in Babylon, but Babylon didn't live in him. He didn't let this pagan world he grew up in to get a hold of his heart. It shows us that Nehemiah was a student of God's word. He was connected to the truth of God so that when the burden became clear, he responded on the stability of God's word. And I believe that's what God's going to stir in your heart. God wants to stir up a vision for you of some burden, some holy discontent that you can begin to take on as a, a mission, as a purpose, as a meaningful part of your life that you can give your life to something. But before you run off and start doing stuff, you pray. You say, God, show me in your word. Confirm it in the scripture so that I know for sure this is the kind of thing you're doing. So that I'm for sure to know this is how I'm to act. And that's exactly what Nehemiah does. So Nehemiah's prayer, before he was going to jump up and do anything, he prays this. And he prays three ways. I'm going to give you the three elements of his prayer. First, he was diligent. He persevered in prayer. He didn't give up in prayer. And I'll tell you what, guys. Our fast-paced world that we live in, is often the enemy of our prayer life because we don't take any time to pray. We're not diligent in prayer. We don't fight through the difficulty of prayer. He was diligent and persevered in prayer. 
So we must also be diligent. The second piece, he was personal. I don't know if you caught this, but Nehemiah in his prayer, he confesses the sins of his nation. He says, God, forgive our nation for all our sin. Forgive us for where we turn from you. And then he includes himself. He says, me and my father's house have sinned against you. On your way to understanding God's vision for your life, you're gonna have to get real with God and let things get personal and say, God, show me where I've sinned and help me confess that sin to you. Because we all have sin in our life that stands in the way of God using us in a powerful way. And we need to come clean and be personal with God and say, God, this is not just because we live in a sinful nation. This is because sin lives in me. And God, I'm gonna own that because I wanna see you do something through me and I don't wanna put roadblocks in your way because of my sin. And Nehemiah confesses his own sin in those moments of prayer. He owns it. And lastly, he's dependent. He begs God to do what only God can do. He asks for God's favor. If you see the last verse, in verse 11, he says, O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant. And he says, and give success to your servant today and grant him favor in the sight of this man. Grant him mercy and favor. So he's asking God for God's success, for God's favor. He's saying, God, I want you to do what only you can do. See, Nehemiah knew something. He had a position that he could leverage. He was the cupbearer to the king. And he knew if he was gonna waltz in there to the king and ask the king for help, he better have God on his side. He's gonna go ask his boss who didn't believe in God, didn't worship God. He's gonna ask his boss to get behind his big idea. He better be sure it's a God idea and he better be sure God's got his back. And he prayed, said, God, give me success. And God responds and God gives him success. And it says, I love this last part. The very last phrase, sentence in the, in the first chapter says, now I was the cupbearer to the king. And you get a sense that Nehemiah was done praying. You get a sense that he had, he had given this all to God and he had felt, he feels confident in God's favor and God's success. And he says, okay, I'm the cupbearer to the king. This is my move. I've got to go in and talk to him. It's time. And so for us today, how do we respond to this? How do we take what Nehemiah lived through and how do we apply it to our lives? Here's how. We have to be diligent in prayer. We have to be personal. And we have to be dependent on the Lord. You will not do it on your own. If you have a burden from God, here's, here's the scary news. You can't do it on your own. He's given you something that you can't accomplish by yourself. And you need God to be with you. And so we have the opportunity today to take a step in God's direction. To say, God, would you give me a burden for my heart? Would you give me something that I can give my life to? And don't, don't overthink it. It doesn't have to be this big, huge rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. It can be, God, help me influence my children every day like I should. God, help me make a difference in my job. God, help me live for you in every area. What I want to do to close our time, if you would just bow your heads and close your eyes. Some of you, undoubtedly, you're, you're drawn to this idea that God can somehow use you, that you can have a, a, a fulfilling mission or purpose in life. I'll tell you where that starts. That starts with a relationship with God. One thing was true about Nehemiah. He had a personal relationship with God. And God offers that to anybody who would respond through his son Jesus. See, God, God had a holy discontent. God's holy discontent was that he was separated from the people that he loved and created for relationship. And what did he do? God sent his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. And so right now, if you'd like to receive Jesus as your savior, I wanna give you a prayer that you can pray. Say, dear Jesus, I admit to you I'm a sinner and I need a savior. Just say that to him right now. Say, dear Jesus, I admit to you that I'm a sinner and I need a savior. Say, I believe that Jesus, you died on the cross for me and you rose from the dead so that I could be forgiven and have eternal life. Just say that, say, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for me and rose from the dead 
so that I could have forgiveness and eternal life. And say, Jesus, I ask you to save me now. Just ask that of him. Say, Jesus, would you save me now?